a very warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park and tonight uh, I thought of discussing the state of the Sri Lankan economy, the way forward, what prospects um, lie ahead for the island nation and the economy. I've invited to our studios a former banker, a former state minister, former deputy minister of uh, enterprise development as well as a former state minister of finance and uh, a deputy minister of investment promotion and highways and uh, a lot of experience in the development banking side. A very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We have with us uh, MP Iran Vikramaratna, who is joining us at Hyde Park, uh, from banking to politics, and then you've held um, some key positions in the enterprise, state enterprise development to finance ministries. Uh, we're looking ahead at a new journey in Sri Lanka, especially because uh, globally we see this pandemic taking over lives and governments forced to think afresh. Um, I'd like to start off with your views about how Sri Lanka is moving ahead. Uh, well, we have come on a journey for 72 years uh, and the, uh, you could say that there were probably uh, a few key milestones in the journey. Uh, one was at the beginning, um, the whole world basically, particularly the emerging nations, the newly independent nations uh, were moved by a more uh, socialist philosophy. <coughs> Um, the people were getting their franchise, right? They were coming out of colonial rule. And therefore, there was a lot of talk about uh, equity, you see, and distribution, free health, free education, and that journey happened. Uh, then in 1977 in Sri Lanka, right, there was, if you want, a, <coughs> a jump to a new paradigm. Uh, led by the then Prime Minister J.R. Jayawardena, and he said uh, we need to be more outward looking than inward looking. And Sri Lanka is integrated to the world, and historically we have been integrated to the world even in the times of our kings. We've been a trading nation, uh, and the economy needs to open. You see, until then, we, you know, very few Sri Lankans travelled abroad. It was just the elites and the well-to-do. Uh, the economy opened up and today millions of Sri Lankans live overseas, work overseas, uh, international trading and the country's living standards have risen uh, over a period of time. But I think that we are at another juncture now. You know, is that policy that we have really sufficient to take Sri Lanka to the next level? Uh, we have been growing at modest growth rates. We can be happy with ourselves when we compare ourselves with South Asia, but if we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, or even with East Asia, we have to be very unhappy. Uh, these countries have leaped ahead of us. You name them, Korea, you see. And we used to call the garden behind temple trees Koreava because there were poor people in Korea and somebody saw that and came and said, this is our Koreava. Uh, we look at Singapore, we look at uh, Malaysia, you know, we, we look at Japan even after the war, how they built themselves up, Asian countries. Mm -hmm. There are lots of other countries. Africa is rising and today even countries like Bangladesh, which we didn't regard as uh, competitors in the past, are all rising. So we have got something wrong in the past and we need to recognize what was wrong and we need to recognize what is needed for the future. And this will involve right, proper political leadership, and it will involve also really uh, people uh, understanding and supporting the new path. Um, we're talking about uh, missed opportunities in the past and the journey that we had never taken. But looking ahead now, uh, the government says they have a policy framework uh, set in order to take us through that journey, to take that leap forward. But you're very critical of um, decisions taken from the budget, you call it nonsensical, and uh, revenue targets to even GDP growth targets. But why is this? They're doing something different, but what, what, what is lagging here? Uh, I, I would say there are two things. One is looking at what they are doing, mm -hmm. and then also, uh, you know, as you said, missed opportunities, looking at the missed opportunities and seeing you know, what went wrong, where did it go wrong, and so forth. Uh, the, the fundamental issue with the present government was that uh, it went around the country basically saying, 
uh, that you know the past government was raising revenues you know, and that was not um, proper and so forth and so on. And naturally, if the business community wants to hear uh, about taxes going down or tax holidays, every businessman, that's natural, normal, because they're running their company, their business. They want to make profits, and that's normal and natural. But when you're in political leadership, you have to look at the whole of society. On one hand, you have producers, and on the other hand, you have consumers. And the government's role is actually to decide you know, what you do for producers, how do you balance it with the interest of consumers. That's what governments are about. So uh, actually, Sri Lanka's revenue has been a running problem, right? At the GDP levels we have, which is about 4,000, uh, per capita income levels we have, which is about $4,000, uh, we should be having you know, revenues of, uh, as a percentage of GDP of about 18, 19, 20 percent. We had dropped to 11, you see, when we took office in 2015. And we recognized that that was one of the big macroeconomic problems and that needed to be corrected. We worked on it. We brought a New England Revenue Act. We set a, up a long-term program, you see, so that Sri Lanka's revenue could be, you know, basically raised sustainably. Uh, the new government just on its announcement and on the election of the president, I think people stopped paying their taxes, you see, because they were anticipating, you know, the law to follow and reductions to come and so forth and so on. Then the tax revenue in the country really drastically dropped at that point in time. Uh, and so when you have a situation like that, right, you create a fundamental problem. Your space, the fiscal space that the government has, it's very, very limited. So uh, at that time, we were estimating that the drop in revenue would have been about one third of the estimated drop. Uh, we need to really see the final December numbers to actually know what the uh, final drop was. Uh, so that's a huge problem, because if you take the expenditure side, there is waste, but there's not much that you can save because more than our revenue, just the salaries and the interest payments alone, right, are basically more than the revenue of the country. So there's very little space there. So you have to really correct it on the revenue side rather than on the expenses side. And then development is largely driven by borrowings, right, and then you have to be conscious of the fact that you have to repay uh, borrowings. So I think the uh, government, without doing a study of what had been done, basically plunged into it. And then you had the COVID pandemic that broke out. When the COVID pandemic broke out, they just didn't have the fiscal space to really uh, do much with the COVID pandemic. So what are the consequences? Consequences are huge job losses. You know, hundreds of thousands of jobs have been lost. People are fortunate if they have a job and if, and if they had permanent employment. And even people who have permanent employment had a drop in their income often. Often, you know, things like allowances were cut, you know, overtime was cut in certain institutions and so forth. So income losses. It's natural from the businessman's point of view that they need to look at survival and sustainability and they have to take all those steps. But looking at it from the point of view of the person working, right? They had, they had that issue. Then GDP growth was slowing down. Naturally, it just crumbled. And by the third quarter, you had about minus 16. Annual growth rate, maybe 5 to 6 percent, you know, minus the annual growth rate. Okay. But I'm not too hooked up on these rates also, because you say 5, and somebody will say, no, it's 3.9, and you will know, argue about it. But I think we need to look at the trends, you know, what, what it is. Uh, so 2020 was a very, very tough year, right? So to build back in 2021, right? The natural advantage is when you have fallen to the flow, you can only rise, you see? So naturally, in terms of growth rates, and that's why I said I'm not too hooked up on rates. In 2021, rates should be always better because you've fallen to the flow and you're rising. It's a little bit like immediately after the war, growth rates pick up. Then it settles after about two years to what you call the natural growth rate. Now, Sri Lanka's natural growth rate is where we will be going to probably in 2022, 2023. Uh, I'm going to stop there. To, uh, maybe you have lots of questions to ask me. Uh, so that's the present climate. But the future, are we going to go at the 2022, 20, 2023 20, natural growth rates? Uh, or are we going to leapfrog? Right? Have we got the vision to do that? And have we got the political courage to do that? 
And that's the real issue, I think, not just responding to the present crisis. And I have lots of views on that. On that note, before we speak of that, I'd like to go back to the period in which you were in power. You, yes. um, you, you, you were running a ministry, you overlook uh, institutions, but there, did you fail to take Sri Lanka forward in this journey that you talk about? Yes, uh, I, I, I uh, would have to admit to that because uh, um, I have to tell you that I was not running a ministry, right? And um, those who are even serving presently, you know, who are state ministers or deputy ministers, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, yesterday in COPE, uh, we had the Foreign Employment Bureau come before COPE, and uh, we found that, that uh, the Foreign Employment Bureau was under a state minister, but the minister had taken a decision to dismiss the police uh, unit that was in the Foreign Employment Bureau. And we at COP were quite amazed because there is a state minister there, um, but th this kind of decision had happened. So the reason I said that example from just yesterday, right, is, is to say that uh, we need to look at it, uh, you know, personal responsibility depends on the responsibility given to a particular individual. But if you look at it as a government, uh, uh, there were things that we did successfully and there were things naturally in every government that could have been done better. Uh, what we did successfully, right, in our government was cr creating the foundations for the microeconomy. We were raising revenue, we were bringing the budget deficit down. We want a journey to bring the budget deficit down to 3.5 percent. You see, that's very, very low. I think in 2020, this government's budget deficit would be at least 9 percent of GDP, you see. Maybe next year they might be able to br bring it down, hopefully, maybe. In the present policy, I don't think they'll bring it down much, maybe 8%, probably same levels, unless they drastically change their policy. And then in our government, right, we had two exogenous factors. In an economy, you have things you can do, it's on your control, right policies, right leadership, right decisions, and you journey. Then there are exogenous factors. You're a small country and things that can affect you from out or unexpected events. Then what do we, do we have? We have a constitutional coup in the country in 2017. This is a very serious issue because no country in the world had such an event. No country in the world. Um, uh, the Sri Lankans haven't really sat back to think about it. That is highly responsible because for a country to develop political stability is of importance. The then Prime Minister is just removed. I was in Kalutara attending a wedding when I just heard uh, over, over the media that a new Prime Minister has been sewn in, right? And then uh, the new Prime Minister comes in and he can't prove his majority in Parliament, right? And then twice votes were taken, he couldn't prove his majority. Then we had to go to the judiciary and the judiciary basically overturned the government. And then the former prime minister was brought back. So that's a serious thing because everybody loses confidence in the system. From businesses to investors to everybody loses confidence. What's going on in this country? So the constitutional coup was one of the major exogenous factors. Then you had the second exogenous factors. One was right, a constitutional coup, 26th of October, right, and then you get reinstated somewhere in December after 52 days, a new government. And then a few months later, you have the Easter bombings, right? The Easter bombings. And that is another huge exogenous factor, right? Huge factor. Because again, no country in the world, right, had an event like that, an exogenous event like that. It was uh, unacceptable, it's unbelievable what happened. 269 people lost their lives, right? Families, right? Innocent people who are very uh, innocently going to religious places of worship, right? And uh, completely in a different mindset, and suddenly lives are lost, right? Some are maimed for life, right? Uh, and this is unacceptable, right? That a thing like this actually happened. Now, when you analyze that, right, and one of the issues that we really are grappling with, right, who is responsible for that? Why haven't those who are responsible brought basically into the justice system? Why haven't they? 
we were told at that time, you know, in a run up to an election, oh, you know, the government is responsible, government of the day. Of course, the government of the day is responsible because you're in office. But now we need to look deeper as to who in government is responsible, who actually knew. Right? And then, then, then you have the situation, you, you go back before the, before the uh, constitutional coup, right? You have a DIG who is going after terrorism. He goes, to, he goes to the magistrate's court. He gets an open warrant to arrest, arrest these uh, terrorists, right? And then the constitutional coup happens. He's arrested for saying that he was trying to assassinate former president uh, Maitripala Sirisena and Gotabe Rajapaksa, former defense secretary. And that was the story that was given, right? And we are wondering why was that story given? And then he's arrested with the constitutional coup. The man who was pursuing terrorism, right? So, is there a connection, you know, between all these events? Who is actually responsible? Who is the brains behind these things? These are the questions that need but to be answered. I saw who had time enough, sufficient time to look into these uh, yeah. and this government. So, oh, what's happening? Yeah. Are we to are we to be suspicious of the entire parliament here? Yeah. So, uh, I think it's not the parliament. <coughs> we we confuse this often. It's the executive branch of government because they are the ones who take the decisions uh, in the executive branch of government, whichever government that is there, right? And and uh, I even saw uh, statements this week, right, by. The, the the Catholic cardinal, right, uh, saying that, you know, we are still waiting. Everybody said there will be justice. We had a change of government on the basis that there will be justice in this. We're still waiting. And then we read reports yesterday that people who were arrested, right, in, and they were supposed to be, uh, the, the factory was supposed to be related to one of the uh, suicide bombers, right and uh, saying that they had a connection, that they were released as well by the AG's department. Because the AG's department has a, a kind of power to basically release people, but explanations are needed. Why is something happening? Those explanations are not there. When I originally started to raise this issue, people started to find fault with me. They said, what is Iran talking about? Why is Iran raising this question? Right. They even went to the extent of trying to connect me, connect me, right, with terrorism. If you speak the truth, right, you sometimes get, you know, all this thrown at you. But that there was no connection in. Um, yeah, the, 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 when you speak the truth, right, people always try to throw something at you. I mean, how ridiculous can such things be? But that won't stop me from speaking the truth. What we need is justice. Right, for those families who lost loved ones. We need justice. I lost friends too, right, in, in the Shangri-La Hotel, right, and, 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 and these people were not in a church, right, unsuspecting people who had gone there, right, and they lost their lives, mother and daughter in one family, right. So we want to know the truth and we need to go after the truth. So, in the very, I'm coming to this for this reason, that the economy is not independent, right, of political activity. It's not independent. It's connected, you see. And I might close on this note, mm -hmm. on this point, that the primary responsibility of the executive arm of government, the chief executive, the president of the country, the primary responsibility is uniting the people in a nation, primary responsibility. Second responsibility is defense and security. The economy will take care of itself because people know better than government about the economy. Business know and know better about creating value than government. It will take care of itself, right? If the executive arm of government realizes its primary responsibility. It's uniting people, all the different groups in the country, and then defense and security, those are the two primary responsibilities. What we are doing in Sri Lankan politics and we have done for decades is divide people, use racism, use uh, divisions, right, racial and religious divisions. That's the difference between countries like Malaysia, Singapore, 
Japan, Korea, and Sri Lanka, and I'm using Asian countries as examples, they were able to resolve their fundamental problems and create a basis. Doesn't matter which government is in power, you see, to put this country at the next level. Um, whether you represent the Samagi Jana Balavege or you're talking on the side of the Sri Lanka Podujana, Peramuna, uh, we talk about systems that need to change within the country. We talk about a new constitution. We talk about a policy, a consistent policy, um, where Sri Lanka could follow this regardless of government change. From a banker to politics, you had a vision. You wanted to uh, bring about change. But unfortunately, you haven't seen that change coming about during, during your time in government and post. But um, if we leave aside your political affiliations, what do you what do you really want Sri Lanka to go? What path do you want Sri Lanka to take in order to um, achieve and reach out to these aspirations that we all have? <coughs> I think we need to address some of the fundamental issues, right? We need to address the f fundamental issues, and they have to do with values, right? And one of the fundamental issues is, right, that every person born in this country is equal. Every person born in this country is equal and has to have dignity. I didn't choose to be born to a Sinhala family. Somebody else didn't choose to be born into a Tamil home or to an Islamic home. We didn't even choose to be born in this country, you see. That's one of the things we didn't do. We didn't even choose our name. Others chose it for us, you see. And sometimes we just get all uh, you know, worked up about you know, these kinds of issues. So I think to take the country forward, we need political leadership that, that recognizes that value and that principle. Everybody is equal, equal before the law, that the law will work equally for everybody. In the very, you know, we say one country, one law. That's not true. One country, two laws, you see. If you are in the privileged class, if you are a politician, right, Clearly, the law doesn't work equally for you, you say. I can give you example after example. I don't need to tell the public who are hearing me that that's not the way it actually works. It works differently. So you need to apply the law. The law has to be worked exactly and equally and as you go forward. So if we have that basic principle and that basic thing sorted out, then we need to come into things like economic policy, mm -hmm. right? When you come into economic policy, right, I think we have to you know, uh, get off this idea that there is only one answer in economic policy. Right? Uh, you know, people try to you know, always put a question before you and trap you and try to say, you know, is this the Pohut policy or is this the SJB policy or somebody else's policy and so forth. I think we need to get out of that and think more widely. Right? Uh, we know that there is now a big debate going on on the East Container Terminal. I'm using that as an example, just as an example, the East Container Terminal, right? We know that there's a debate going on. I think we need to go to the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals? Sri Lanka's one big advantage is its locational positioning. If there are going to be movements from East to West and West to East, from Sri Lanka, not just to the Indian subcontinent, we could transship into the Middle East to Africa. It's just fortunate location that we have got. We need to maximize it, right, as a transshipment point, a logistics hub that, that we can really make use of this and benefit. So to do that, we have to think big, right? We had one terminal, the Jaya terminal, owned by the government. Mm -hmm. so then Chandrika Kumar Natunga's government had a privatized terminal, right? That's the SLFP government. Right, at a privatized terminal. What was the slogan of the SLFP in 1956? Basically, to take over the private sector. They had come full circle and gone the other way. The father's policies were not followed by the daughter. It had taken a full circle. What did the UNP do? We didn't oppose it. We stood there, even when she brought it. SAGT was created, one of the most efficient terminals, right, just in a global comparison. Then. Mahinda Rajapaksa's government comes in. They create CICT, right? a Chinese-owned terminal. Again, a terminal which is very, very profitable, right? and it, it turned it around. But what is the language that they use? We will not sell anything. 
right? Uh, right? False patriotism, these are strategic assets, we must hold on to them, right? And this is the language they use, but economic decisions they taken were quite contrary, and they were the correct economic decisions for the country. Now there is a debate about the East Termina, right? Because in the East Termina was supposed to be a joint venture between Sri Lanka, India, and Japan, right? And then they will have their nominated companies from India and Japan, right? So what is this debate about? Our vision has to be bigger. Investment has no race or color. It's the rule of law that's important. If we are really going to develop this country, right, economically, it's not just the East Terminal. We need the East Terminal. We need the West Terminal. We need Northern Terminals. We can have several terminals we can build. Sri Lanka can build. Global politics can change. If the situation in Thailand changes, they may cut the car canal through Thailand. Ships might bypass Singapore into Colombo. This is the opportunity that we have. Right? We have to think big. But we can't do this on our own. We need the foreign investment to do it, you see? So we have to think big, and we have to think differently. This is why I said that we can go the usual route, and by 2022, 2023, we can have the, U the natural growth rate, or we can leapfrog. So it takes vision, but it takes political courage, right? Political courage to do these things. And let's take a short break at Hyde Park on Other Than a 24. Welcome back. We're in discussion with MP Ran Vikramaratna of the Samagi Janabalavegya. Uh, you were talking about the need for political will and leadership. Uh, but this government uh, uh, talks about their requirement, a policy that they look forward to take Sri Lanka forward uh, to an ocean economy where that, uh, where that kind of uh, economic development is generated within the country, import ras rationalization in order to um, spur growth by allowing import competing industries to grow within the country rather than rely on imports. Um, and revenue generation, yes, you talk about um, you know, how revenue has been shut. But again, we see that uh, Sri Lanka has faced a lot of troubling times, especially after the Easter attacks and then now with this ongoing pandemic. But uh, are you saying that this government has not placed its priorities right in order to uh, manage these situations? Uh, yeah, so uh, as I said earlier, uh, the priority of the executive is actually the more fundamental things of, of you know, uniting people mm -hmm. and, and security and so forth, and then, the, then on the economy. On the economy, I think uh, the fundamentally, I think that the policy framework, now you referred to saying uh, local companies need to be uh, built up, mm -hmm. right, and uh, therefore import restrictions or protection, right. I think we have to think through this, you see. Uh, you can't have it both ways. Just imagine if we continue, right, with uh, an import restriction policy, somebody is going to turn around and say that we don't need your exports either. We are all signatories to the WTO arrangements, mm -hmm. right, Sri Lanka. And if you are going the open road, then you have to be ready to compete. You can provide certain protections for a period of time, particularly if you have infant industries and so forth. But you need to be very clear about your total policy and your total picture. Because the rest of the world has to buy your goods. A small island nation like ours, our future is in our exports. This domestic market is too small to keep raising our living standards. We have to exploit the opportunities elsewhere. And we need to be clear in our thinking on these things. We can't be saying one thing one day and then saying another thing another day and another thing. There's inconsistency. You remember after we had the, 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 the war in this country and it was settled, our government battled it out to basically get the concessions, like the GSP Plus, for example. We, we got that, right? Uh, we had a ban on selling fish into Europe. We got that lifted up. We were basically expanding our markets. That was the whole idea, expand your markets, right? So if you are going to do a very inward-looking policy, you need to be cautious of the fact that right, your export markets also could be affected. That is what I meant by consistency of, pol of policy. 
then investors coming into this country. Investment investors are going to look one, fund one political stability, rule of law. Country risk is based on that. Before they look at the economy in a country risk analysis, you look at political stability, rule of law. Right? This is essential. Political stability in this year and a half, right, is regarded as a law, right? Because different communities have come under threat, right, and they have been concerned about it, right? That there can be an instability, right? So the government has to basically create the fundamental foundation. Then rule of law, right? I mean, if you read the newspaper every day, right, right, people have been uh, brought by the AG's department, Attorney General's department, before a court of law. And then every other day, the AG's department is either withdrawing the case or the case is being put and the case is being dismissed, right? And it's just going on and on and on. And I, I can name case after case. Right, from the Pillan case, right, to the Silredi case, right. Then uh, you had uh, the Basil Rajapaksa case. Then, then you had uh, um, this uh, Easter bombing uh, victim, uh, the suspects case. Then you had Ravi Raj, the former MP, where Navy intelligence officers were held. That case, right. So, what are we really telling the world? Forget governments, what are we telling the world? We are telling the world that our judicial system, there's something wrong with it. We can keep pointing fingers at each other in parliament and this will go, right? Uh, they can point fingers at us because we were in office. Three years from now, we will be pointing fingers at them and I think we just need to get off this. The judicial system needs to work. Professionals can't hide behind politicians. Professionals Wherever they sit, if they're sitting in the system, at some point in the system, they have to basically stand up and make the right decision. This is the way the country can go forward. Every day you hear this thing about, oh, there are 225 people in parliament and all of them are corrupt. Everybody knows that all of them are not corrupt. There are obviously some corrupt politicians. There's a civil service. Everybody knows that everybody in the civil service is not corrupt. There are corrupt civil servants. Recently, Ranjan Ramanayaka right, was sentenced for contempt of court. Right? Everybody knows that everybody in the judicial system or judges are not corrupt. We know that. We hold them in high esteem. But that does not mean that there are individuals who may be. In every, in every institution in society, there will be individuals. Because all human beings are weak, and there will be individuals. That doesn't bring the stature of the institution down because the vast majority are holding it up. But then the vast majority of us are also responsible for those who make a mistake that the due process of law will follow so that that could be established. You take the, you take the, 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 the clergy, whether it's a Buddhist clergy, the, the uh, Christian clergy, or any other clergy, we all know that there are uh, individuals within that who have uh, made mistakes. And so often we read in the newspapers, particularly in other countries, even if you didn't read in this country, that even they are being brought before the law. Okay. And, and, and it is being corrected. So if we are to basically progress, right, these are fundamental things. I, I regard the economy as basically following some of the more fundamental issues. Then the investors will get confidence. Then the investors will basically say, I'm going to you know, put this money in Sri Lanka because they want long-term stability. Small investors, five years return. Bigger investors will be looking at 10 and 15 years, and they want to see the stability over 10 or 15 years. So I think that we can get there. But you have to have the political will and the forthrightness and the courage to do what is right. Uh, you did speak about investments and that uh, investment shouldn't be uh, uh, decided based on color, race, or country. But uh, there has been a lot of political um, controversy surrounding China, India, the United States, the involvement in these uh, in in the country. Um, in in order to decide investments going forward and balancing these superpowers, uh, what policies do you suggest we um, we we uh, take into account? And that's a very good question you asked, because that question 
should be looked at and answered in a way, not through a political party or a particular government. Sri Lanka's foreign policy, we, are f we must be fiercely independent because we have come out of 500 years of colonial rule. It doesn't matter which government is in power. We must be fiercely independent. And our independence will depend on our foreign policy. Our independence is not going to depend via external forces, right, by the use of armaments. We're a small country in the Indian Ocean. We need to know our place in the world. Our best security is our foreign policy. And Sri Lanka's foreign policy must always be non-aligned. I pay tribute to Madam Sirimavo Bandaranayaka, right, that, that these decisions were made early and that she took a stand and she was a leader of the non-aligned movement. And subsequent Sri Lankan leaders have tried to maintain that non-aligned foreign policy standard. And we must continue to it. We are not going to be a vassal state of China or of India or any other po emerging power like we were of European powers. And all Sri Lankans need to be clear of that. So every government must be held responsible to make sure that our security is going to be in our foreign policy. Then it comes to investments, right? So we have a Chinese investment, we have a European shipping investments, now Indian and Japanese. I think looking at the geopolitics, governments should look at it in an open mind in balancing it. But it's a rule of law. Then people come up with this thing that some, uh, they say this is strategic and you know, and, and they are imagining things like, my heavens, you know, these guys will use this for war. They may bring their aircrafts or they may bring their ships and anything like that. That's up to us. We will not permit those things in the agreements. There's no way we should be permitting those. These are commercial decisions and only should be allowed commercially. World War I and World War II were fought with aircrafts and with ships. The future wars are not going to be fought just with aircrafts and ships. Future wars are going to be fought right, with technology and with viruses. After COVID, we better open our eyes and not get trapped in the old thinking. We have to really think anew. Right? Our security is in our policy and our foreign policy and how we deal with the rest of the world. Right? Let's use all our other assets for, the, for commercial benefit so that the citizens of this country have higher living standards without getting caught up in all these things that are thrown at us that, you know, that you know, they will you know, take this and they will take that. We guard ourselves through the use of law, right? We can't guard ourselves by the use of guns against these big foreign powers, by the use of law. So I think the Sri Lankan leaders need to understand this. That's the route that we have to actually take. And therefore, we need not to be basically running away, right? We should not be running away. We should look at the commercial viability. We should look at the benefit to the normal people in this country. We have to be ambitious. We have to be big. And we have to take bold decisions. In 1956, when that revolution, as I said, happened at that time, they said, we don't need foreign investment. We want the foreigners to get out of here. We had foreign oil companies here in this country, right? So we threw them out. We threw Shell and I think BP out. What did they do? They went to Singapore. They set up there. They set up their refineries near their port, right? The rest of the story is known. We are $4,000 per capita, and Singapore is $60,000 per capita, 15 times greater, right? Is Singapore a vassal state of any superpower? We have got one minute. It is not a vassal state of any superpower. That should be the cleverness of leadership. So not just to get caught in all these, you know, uh, false, you know, patriotic stories and just fool people and, and what happens ultimately in the very I'm glad that you have decided to remain in this country. You are young and I'm hoping that you will continue to remain in this country because a lot of middle class youth who are educated are thinking of making other countries their home. I'm in politics to stop that because we have to create a Sri Lanka for them because families must be united. Thank you very much uh, for your time. We had with us uh, former State Minister of Finance, former Deputy Minister of State Enterprise Development and MP Iran Vikramaratna joining us uh, here at Hyde Park. Of course, I wanted to speak a lot about COPE and state enterprises too, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Another time.
Certainly. Thank you very much for joining us here at Hyde Park on Other Derana 24.